So I was fortunate enough to receive a Churchill Fellowship in 2016. My Churchill Fellowship was on investigating best practice to prevent illness and disease in tunnel construction workers. And I'm going to go through a very high level presentation of some of the gold I found as part of that journey. But to kick it off, um, I thought I'd set the context. I want you to think about how much energy, effort, systems and resources we all put into preventing one fatality due to a safety incident at work each and every year. It's money well spent, it's systems and resources well spent, but how much energy, effort, systems and resources do we put into preventing fatality due to illness and disease? Because this is how many men and women by comparison will actually succumb to fatality due to that. The ratio is one to eight. So have a think about within your own organisations, how much focus do you put on health in addition to safety? They're both incredibly important. However, sometimes I think the balance is skewed. To put it into context in the tunnel industry, we'll plan to tunnel further in the next seven years than we have in more than the past two decades. Almost two thirds of all the tunnelling in Australia occurs in Sydney, and all tunnelling will encounter shale and Hawkesbury sandstone. That sandstone, and to a smaller extent shale, mainly consists of quartz. And tunnelling through any quartz containing rock generates a carcinogenic dust known as respirable crystalline silica. Overexposure to silica dust is known to cause an incurable disease uh, called silicosis, as well as lung cancer. And the risk of developing silicosis from exposure to silica dust at our current legal limit over a worker's working life is estimated to be anywhere from 12 to 77 per cent of workers. However, silica from freshly fractured rock is more toxic than any other type of silica dust. And during tunnel construction, crystalline silica exposures have been measured to be more than 20 times that legal limit. And the common last line of defence applied to protect the health of our tunnel workers can tend to be the P2 dust mask. But to put that into perspective, I thought I'd use this picture from Work Health and Safety Queensland of a five cent coin to try to show just how much that legal limit or that workplace exposure standard is for silica dust. Now, this small amount of dust represents the workplace exposure standard, like the daily exposure for silica dust at the moment in Australia. Now I want you to cast your mind back to every single construction project that you've ever driven by and think about how much dust you actually saw coming out of that basement excavation, for example. It's probably a little bit more than what is shown on the screen. This is a snapshot of Australian tunnelling in terms of kilometres to be tunnelled over time from 95 to 2021. We're obviously in the peak of an infrastructure boom, but it presents an opportune time at this point to not only look outwards internationally, but also learn from our past. And it was at this point that I thought what a, thought a great opportunity to actually go and try to get a Churchill Fellowship so that we can actually go and have a look at international best practice and see what we can be doing better in Australian tunnelling. As part of the Churchill Fellowship, I visited quite a number of major tunnel, uh, tunnel projects, including uh, the Thames Tideway in the UK, Crossrail, High Speed Rail 2, Belkin Renovation Tunnel, uh, Alp Transit, Gotthard, um, and a number of projects in the US, um, including the SR99 Alaskan Way Viaduct, which was amazing. I also visited some research institutions and some major conferences, such as the World Tunnel Congress in Norway. But before I went, I spent a lot of time actually looking at existing best practice frameworks for health and safety to establish eight elements for investigation. The first and the most important was leadership, because I wanted to understand what impact leadership had on actually driving better health outcomes for tunnel workers at the tunnel face, per se. I wanted to look at the impacts of and the importance of health and design, how well international organisations were at engagement and collaboration. I wanted to look at standards, both contractual and legal standards. I wanted to look at targeted management or things that uh, would specifically reduce silica dust exposure versus program management, which is the systematic way that a health and safety system is applied. I wanted to look at training and awareness campaigns and what could we be doing better. And lastly, and also most importantly, sustainability. How can we make sure that any initiative we do in Australia is sustainable and actually uh, is retained no matter who is in charge or who is delivering that tunnel project? So I'll start with leadership. I found that visible and effective leadership, actually starting with the client organisation, 
was found to be an essential part of preventing illness and disease by the time workers started on site. How many of you put that level of leadership and importance on health um, in the way that you do business? Because internationally, it's very, very strong. Leadership at that client level was demonstrated to create more stakeholders that also began to drive health within their own organisations. And focusing on occupational health started way at the beginning in the design stage, before tenders were awarded. Um, and they continued to be promoted and outlined through contractual requirements and tender evaluation. Therefore, the clients made it very clear from the outset to all contractors what the standard would be. There was no surprises. Internationally, I found some great examples in the UK on engagement and collaboration. I saw that um, groups such as the BOHS Breathe Freely campaign, um, some initiatives through the transforming tunnel safety groups allowed multiple projects to actually come together and share knowledge so that good practices were adopted earlier than they may have been otherwise. And these industry groups both raised awareness but also drove a best practice approach beyond mere compliance. And engagement with research partners enabled a greater understanding um, of the magnitude of the issues leading to better control measures being implemented. In Norway, for example, they have a really good um, uh, collaboration with local research institutions, and Thames Tideaway have a really good partnership with Loughborough University. Um, so it's great at Sydney Metro that we have that type of relationship with RMIT as well. Internationally, I found some great examples of training and awareness campaigns. Uh, for those that haven't seen this, this is from Crossrail's Health and Safety Impact Series. It's called Jenny's Story. It's a very short video that helps raise awareness of silica dust or um, dust exposure. And things like this highlighted that we need to be doing more than a simple poster in a crib shed sort of campaign. Not to say that they're not useful, but internationally they're doing more. I also found some great initiatives in the US. Um, the use of helmet cam or a lapel uh, camera linked to a real-time dust monitor, which was able to help workers um, and occupational hygienists and health and safety professionals actually look at where peak sources of exposure were happening um, in the underground environment. And a really good example might be that you'll find peaks of exposure when heavy plant operators might sit down in a fabric seat, for example, but you wouldn't actually see that dust when you're doing your day-to-day -day activity. Construction and tunnelling projects internationally have mandated targeted contractual requirements that, uh, or refer to legal standards that are more stringent than what we have in Australia. Some countries have fantastic and very high grade uh, legal requirements and where they're not there, then they're countered by uh, very uh, detailed contractual requirements by the client to close that gap. I found internationally that ongoing independent verification of exposure controls or things that should be in place by some authority able to stop the work um, has demonstrated to drive compliance and further improvements and therefore lower risks of disease developments. Really good examples of that would be the UK, Switzerland um, and the USA. When it came to health in design, I saw that addressing health way at the beginning in the design stage resulted in many more higher order controls being able to be applied uh, prior to construction, so not leaving it to the construction teams. And if health risks weren't able to be eliminated, which is pretty rare for them to be able to be in construction, then there was a requirement to demonstrate internationally how those health risks would be managed all the way through the project life cycle through to O&M. So program risk management was really interesting as part of the fellowship. I found that occupational hygiene as a discipline was managed together with occupational health and wellbeing as a holistic approach. Appreciating that, uh, for example, it's great to have a wellbeing program, but what are we actually doing about preventing exposures to things that cause illness and disease? Um, and what are we doing about that work that workers' health from a clinical perspective? So I found it managed really well internationally. A great example is in the UK. I found that initial health risk assessments were used to drive decisions on controls, monitoring uh, and health surveillance, um, as is the case at Sydney Metro. And health surveillance through occupational physicians complemented by uh, competent health clinical services and a standardised approach for what is deemed fit for duty um, and the centralised collection of data uh, was observed. And by doing that, it enables people to um, uh, look at trends which then inform future interventions at, and policy. At the moment in Australia, this area is incredibly lacking because we don't have a centralised health surveillance system, so we're not able to have that sort of data. 
There were many control measures that were observed internationally to specifically control exposures to silica dust. Um, and I'll say that many of these are not new to Australia. I've worked on many tunnelling projects where I've seen these implemented incredibly well. Um, but what tends to fail us on some of these projects is that they're not always implemented each and every time, um, and they're not consistently applied. And that really goes back to leadership and the requirement to have it in place in the first place. Internationally, every tunnelling project in the UK has or is in the process of developing some form of legacy learning website. And things like that enable, uh, ensures that good information is captured while fantastic team members are on the project and you don't lose sort of that sort of good information when they go to the next tunnelling project that inevitably pops up. Also, the use of um, benchmarking tools like the Occupational Health Maturity Metrics, which is a uh, one to six uh, scale, which is used to rank contractors in terms of their maturity in their systems of um, managing occupational health, were observed to really drive best practice and perhaps some healthy competition. So in summary, what is best practice? Well, I found that best practice involves leadership driven by the client, but working in collaboration with a very competent contractor and complemented by a strong regulator. I found that it involves major projects engaging and collaborating throughout the supply chain, also with research institutions and with other major projects. I found that health, medical surveillance and wellbeing being managed holistically is best practice. And contractual requirements and tender evaluation occurring for health aspects in addition to safety is very important. There were many tools available to assess and control risk to health, but best practice involves them being implemented each and every time. And the use of performance metrics that really push best practice has resulted in healthy competition and uh, a better control of health risks. And knowledge sharing is commonplace across legacy websites and industry forums such as today. So the Churchill Fellowship demonstrated some key areas of improvement for us in Australia. The first is leadership and the importance of such leadership across all operating client organisations in the importance of health in addition to safety. The second was to improve the way and the amount of collaboration and engagement we have across all our major tunnelling projects. The third was to strengthen our standards as an industry, um, both legal uh, and contractual, and to increase training and awareness um, around silica dust. And lastly, to improve our processes of health surveillance. The Churchill Fellowship Report was published on the Churchill Trust website um, in July of last year. So a lot has happened since that time. Um, a lot of work has been done by our health and safety regulator, SafeWork New South Wales. A lot of work has been done by many clients and fantastic tunnelling contractors, many of whom are in this room, and through the Australasian Tunnelling Society and the formation of an air quality working group. And a lot has been done at Sydney Metro to even further improve the systems that we're working on. Uh, in short, the Churchill Fellowship demonstrated some key areas for improvement and the industry has been uh, received an overwhelming response and how quick everyone's been at actually taking up uh, some of the items that have been identified and really working to, um, to close them out and making some improvements. So I'd like to thank the Churchill Trust for um, uh, sponsoring such a Churchill Fellowship because this is an important issue that affects the health of thousands of Australian workers each and every year and it's great to finally shine a light on health in addition to safety in this industry. Thank you.